We're very excited to have him here. Uh, he's a Dyke Fellow, of course, and we're very proud of that. And we're looking forward to this presentation and in the years ahead as to all the great things that he is going to do. So I am, uh, again, excited to have Dr. Andrews here to present here at our Dyke Conference. So I'm going to give you Dr. Andrews. Well, thank you so much for that uh, extremely kind, if overly generous introduction, and uh, wonderful to see you all. Great to uh, be here in person with all of you uh, to find out that not everyone has become a computer simulation. Um, so thank you all very, very much. And today I'm uh, excited to present uh, my work, Inference on Winners, which is joint work with uh, Toru Kitagawa and Adam McCloskey. Um, I don't know, unless we have sort of rules about questions, um, I would be thrilled for folks to jump in with questions at any time. The uh, run time for this talk is considerably shorter than the time allotted on the program. So uh, please, please, please jump in with questions. We'd love to hear from everyone. So with that, uh, let me get started. So the motivation for this project is that in many contexts, right, we use data to choose from among several possible actions. Right, think, for example, of policymakers choosing from among several proposed policies uh, based on their estimated effects. Or regulators or clinicians choosing from among several drugs based on data from clinical trials. Or technology companies choosing from among several website designs based on A-B tests. Or financial firms choosing from among several trading strategies based on returns and historical data. Now, all of those examples that I just listed share a certain common structure which is that we first estimate how good each of several actions is according to some criteria, and then we pick the winner or the best action based on those initial estimates. Now, something else that all of those examples share is that when we sort of do this, we encounter a version of a winner's curse, where if we implement the winning action, right, this action which appeared to be the best one given the data that guided our choice, we'll tend to find that the results are systematically disappointing relative to our initial estimates. So to sort of illustrate this phenomenon, I want to start by just thinking about a stylized example, which I'll use to illustrate the source of this bias and then to illustrate some corrections that we're proposing in this project. So for this stylized example, imagine a researcher who's running a randomized trial evaluating uh, outcomes under two treatments. Right, I'll index these treatments by theta, call them treatments theta 1 and theta 2. Right, so the average outcome in the experiment under treatment theta 1 is going to be x theta 1. Under treatment theta 2 is going to be x theta 2. Now, since we're running a nice experiment here, these, are going to be, uh, these uh, experimental average outcomes are going to be unbiased for the average outcomes in the population. So call that mu theta 1 and mu theta 2. Right, so the average outcome in the population, if I implement policy theta 1 versus theta 2, but for the stylized example, let's further suppose that those experimental estimates are normally distributed with identity variance covariance matrix. Now, given the results from such an experiment, right, I try treatment one, I try treatment two, I face a question of what to recommend. One thing that's very natural is to recommend treatment theta hat, which is the arg max of x theta, right? So I recommend the treatment that led to the highest outcome in the experiment, right? The thing that looked best based on my initial data. Now, along with such a recommendation, we might also want an assessment for the effectiveness of this recommended treatment, right? Which you could think of as estimates and confidence sets for mu theta hat. That is, an estimate or a confidence set for the true average outcome under this estimated best treatment. When we do this, though, we run into this winner's curse that I alluded to before. In particular, note that theta hat equals theta one, that is, I recommend the first treatment, only if x theta 1 is greater than or equal to x theta 2, right? I recommend the first treatment only if it did better in the experiment. But that means that if I think about the distribution of x theta 1, right, that is the distribution of my estimated average outcome under the first treatment, conditional on recommending the first treatment, well, that distribution is going to be truncated below, right? Specifically, it's truncated below at the sort of outcome for the second best treatment. And what does that mean? That means that the probability that x theta 1 is greater than mu theta 1, right, the probability that my estimate for the effectiveness of treatment 1 exceeds the true effectiveness, conditional on recommending the first treatment, 
that probability is going to be strictly greater than a half. Right? So conditional on recommending treatment one, I overestimate its effectiveness on average. But the problem I set up here is totally symmetric in theta one, theta two. So the same is going to be true unconditionally as well. Right? So the unconditional probability that I overestimate the effectiveness of my recommended treatment is strictly greater than a half. Right? And so what is this saying? This says that my estimated effectiveness for my recommended treatment is upward median biased. Likewise, uh, you can show that the sort of standard confidence that we would use, right, which just takes our estimated effectiveness for the recommended treatment, adds and subtracts 1.96 standard errors, you can show that that's going to undercover. Right? It'll be systematically over-optimistic. So to explore sort of whether this kind of bias looks like a big deal numerically, right, let's extend that toy example a bit. Let's think about cases with 2, 10, or 50 treatments. Where again, I'm going to still think about identity variance covariance matrix to keep things simple. And I'm going to assume that the first treatment is weakly more effective than the second treatment, but that all the remaining treatments are equally effective. Right? So uh, I've got mu theta 1, which is the true average outcome under treatment 1, and then mu theta minus 1, which is the true average outcome under all other 1 or 9 or 49 treatments. In this setting, I'm going to think about the performance of the conventional estimator. Right, so just the estimated effectiveness of the treatment that I'm recommending, as well as the conventional or more pejoratively naive confidence set, which takes that estimated effectiveness, adds and subtracts 1.96 standard errors. So if we do this, uh, we run into exactly the sort of bias that I was discussing earlier. Right, so here what I'm showing you is a measure of the median bias. So this is the overestimation probability, right, the probability that I overestimate the effectiveness of the recommended treatment minus a half. Right, so if everything were working great, we didn't have a bias issue, all these lines would be flat at zero, but they're not. And in particular, on the horizontal axis here, I've got mu theta 1 minus mu theta minus 1. So that's the effectiveness of the first treatment minus the effectiveness of the remaining treatments. And I'm looking at cases with 2, 10, or 50 different treatments. Right, so the way to read this is, for example, when both treatments are equally effective and I have just two of them, I've got about a 75% chance of overestimating the effectiveness of my recommended treatment. As I make the first treatment better than the second treatment, that overestimation probability comes down, and eventually I'm equally likely to over and underestimate when the first treatment is much, much better than the second treatment. If I increase the number of treatments considered to 10, that overestimation probability jumps to nearly 100% when the treatments are equally effective. But again, if I make one treatment much better than the other, eventually it comes down. And why does it come down? Well, because if one treatment is you know, 10 standard errors better than the second treatment, I'm always going to pick the better treatment. This selection issue basically goes away. Right? And so that's why we end up seeing these biases in the case where the treatments are of roughly equal effectiveness. If I increase the number of treatments to 50, picture is qualitatively similar. Now, that was showing you bias in terms of overestimation probability, but we could look at bias in other ways too. So for example, here I'm showing you the median estimation error. Again, right, we see that the bias is increasing in the number of treatments considered and is worst when all the treatments are of similar effectiveness. Now, in addition to bias, we also might care about coverage, right? So how often does my usual confidence interval cover the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment? Interestingly, if we think about the case with just two treatments, there's actually not another coverage problem in this toy example that I've sketched here. But if I increase the number of treatments to 10 or 50, right, we see that the coverage probability for you know, this thing that's supposed to cover the truth 95% of the time drops to about 80% and then to about 30% as I increase the number of treatments. So that was uh, sort of running through the stylized example to try to give you a sense of what is this winner's curse bias that we're worried about. Before I move on to talking about the solutions that we're going to propose to it, let me pause here. Are there any questions? Exactly. So here we're sort of, great question, here we're working in exactly like you're saying, sort of a very, very simple, you know, very, very simple uh, setup where, you know, we're just thinking about a one-dimensional outcome. I'm not trying to balance multiple things. Of course, you could think about, you know, you're thinking about some intervention and you care about uh, its effects on both, you know, 
wages and employment and a measure of health, right? And you care about all three of those, and then you face a question of how to trade those off. Here, we're sort of thinking about a one-dimensional case where you know, either I say, no, 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 I just care about what's the effect on employment, or I've you know, pre-specified how am I going to aggregate up, how do I think about the effect on wages, and how do I think about the effect on employment, and how do I think about the effect on health? Of course, in a setting where you're actually doing something multidimensional, the same issues come up. You're, it just gets even harder. So in that sense, uh, adding in that additional layer of complexity will only make things harder to what we're doing here rather than easier. But one could also adapt the corrections that I'll tell you about to that case. assess this bias, is there perhaps, and perhaps you'll get to this, is there a role for permutation-based inference to consider all the possible nulls and all the, before you go on to address it? Is there a role for permutation-based inference? Yeah, so that's, yeah. A, that's a really interesting question. Uh, for the particular purpose that we're thinking about here, there isn't, actually. But, right, because in some sense, when you're, when you're thinking about permutation-based inference, right, so permutation-based inference would be something where, right, basically imagine I flip the labels on what all these different treatments are and sort of permute the labels and then look at the distribution of different stuff that's happening under those different permutations. That would be for example, a very natural thing to do if what I were interested in is, say, testing that all these treatments have the same effect, right? So I'm testing a hypothesis across treatments. Here, though, just the goal that we've set up for ourselves is that, no, 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 I'm, I'm picking some particular treatment based on the data, and then I'm trying to do inference on that particular one. And so uh, there are definitely lots and lots of problems where permutation-based inference gets us exactly something we want. But for this one, because I'm focused in on a specific treatment, uh, we're going to need to do something else. Or, Can you give an intuitive explanation of why it's so different in the case of winning and losing? So it's actually, it's totally symmetric. It, so imagine that instead of uh, inference on winners, we wanted to think about inference on losers. Right, so basically I said, I'm gonna look at 10, two treatments or 10 treatments or 50 treatments, and I'm gonna think about, you know, what, is, what happens to my estimate for the one that I think to be the worst? The problem is actually totally symmetric, and it's just that in that case, you would end up with, uh, right, instead of ending up basically truncating things below, I would end up truncating things above, and so instead of getting an upward bias, I would get a downward bias. But in that sense, actually, inference on the winner, inference on the loser, inference on the middle, actually, even inference on the one that I think is in the middle also turns out to be biased. Just the pattern of bias ends up being more complex. But so the, the way I would think about this is that um, this issue where I end up having a substantial bias because I'm sort of selecting the treatment to focus on in this data-driven way, that shows up for many, many different forms of selection. The reason we focus the paper on the winner is just because uh, very frequently folks, you know, run a horse race and pick the thing that they think does the best. And so in practice, that seems like an important case. But absolutely, as you're saying, other cases absolutely show up too, and bias shows up in all those cases. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, when I think of one of the motivations you gave of we pick something and we started doing it and maybe gives us disappointing, which is probability that gives us less than the mean. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of situations in which I you observe outcomes of different time periods. And so is the, is the dimension of time here, which is not obviously in the model, something that I should understand? Like, well, those are the repeated things, or we should understand as like anything post the intervention, it's all captured in that parameter X data. Yeah, yeah so sort of, so, so far, um, so again, yeah, these are all really, really great questions. Thank you very much. So, so far, I'm basically thinking about a static world, right, where sort of we, we, run, one, we run an experiment in one round, we get the data from that one round, and then we're doing the analysis with that. If I had multiple rounds, right, so imagine I, I run an experiment, right, and then I say, okay, I think treatments one, two, and three look the best, and so then I go and I rerun the experiment looking at just treatments one, two, three. In that world, right, because I'm getting new data in the second round, I, my estimates in, round, in the second round won't be biased, but actually something we show in the paper is that actually if I just use the data from the second round for my inference, I am actually doing something inefficient, 
basically there's a way to get more information by continuing to use the data from round one. And we talk about in the paper the best way to do that. Yeah, so if you reduce the number of, uh, of, of, of treatments, you're actually creating a form of a selection bias in your next round. But my question is, related to this, is, is this sensitive to the number of trials that you run? Or does the degree of bias decline if you have conducted more trials? Yeah, so more trials, you mean like a, like a bigger trial or more rounds of trials? No, more rounds. More rounds, yeah. More horse races. Sorry? Yeah, so, so basically, so the way I would think about it is the, right, so the degree of bias is increasing in the number of treatments that I'm comparing, right? So if I, you know, if I compare two treatments, I have a bias, but it's smaller than if I have 10 treatments, which is smaller than if I have 50 treatments. If I, as I make the number of observations per round of the trial, right, so if I'm assigning 10 people versus 50 people versus 50 million people to each treatment, right, basically the, the degree of the bias is getting smaller as I make the um, number of people assigned to each treatment bigger. And then on, in terms of number of rounds, um, if I, you know, am running a one round trial versus I run something and then I run something and then I run something and then I run something, basically there, however many rounds I run, as long as I'm not doing anything selective based on the last round, right, I actually won't have a bias problem if I'm just using information from the last round, right? So I, I run 20 different, 20 different rounds of clinical trial and I do something very, very complicated, but then, you know, at the end of round 19, I say, okay, I'm gonna focus on, you know, this particular intervention and I run a trial looking at that intervention, then my estimates coming out of that last round are unbiased because in some sense, like I ran a clean clinical trial focused on that specific thing, but the more rounds of trials I ran before, in some sense, the more information I'd be leaving on the table if in fact I only use the data from that last round. And so in that context, basically, it's not the focus of what I'll talk about today, but one way to use the results of our project is basically to say, how can I get all the information that's actually in those previous 19 rounds that I'd be losing if I did sort of the more traditional thing and just focused on the information from the last round, if that makes sense. Awesome. Other questions at this stage? Fantastic, thank you all very, very, very much for the questions. Um, so, having hopefully motivated this problem a bit, uh, let me now tell you about our proposed solution. So, not surprisingly, right, having shown you that there's a bias here, what we're gonna try to do is develop corrected inference procedures. But to do that, right, we need to start by defining what we mean for inference to be correct in this context. And in that vein, we're gonna think about two different notions of corrected inference. So the first is what we'll call conditional inference. So for conditional inference, this is gonna say, I want my inference procedures to be valid, conditional on the treatment on theta hat, right? So I want my estimates or my confidence sets to be valid, conditional on the policy that I'm recommending. So for confidence sets, for instance, this would say I want conditional coverage. So the probability that the true effectiveness of my recommended treatment lies in my confidence set, conditional on the recommendation made, I want that to be 95% or whatever. Right? Likewise, for estimators, we can think about conditional median unbiasedness. So the probability that I overestimate the effectiveness of the recommended treatment, conditional on the recommendation made, should be a half. Alternatively, though, I could also think about unconditional validity. Right, where for unconditional validity, I'm gonna require validity only on average across different treatment recommendations I might make, not particular on a given recommendation. Right, so uh, in particular for confidence sets, this would correspond to unconditional coverage probability being at least one minus alpha. For estimators, this would correspond to the unconditional overestimation probability being a half. Now, the law of iterated expectations tells us that uh, unconditional validity is less demanding than conditional validity in the sense that if you give me a conditionally valid procedure, I can use the law of iterated expectations to show that it's also unconditionally valid. That also means, though, that the class of unconditional procedures is larger, right? And so if all I actually care about is validity on average across different recommendations I might make, then uh, I may actually be able to obtain better performance than if I focus on conditional inference. 
So I've introduced these two different goals, conditional versus unconditional validity, They kind of abstract. I think it's useful to talk through an example of sort of what does each of these actually mean? So to that end, right, let's go back to an example where we're thinking about just two treatments, theta one, theta two. And imagine that theta one is some new treatment, right? This is some new policy we're thinking about advocating, while theta two is a control, right, which is basically gonna be the baseline status quo policy. Now, if I impose only unconditional validity and the probability that I recommend treatment theta one is small, right, so I'm unlikely to recommend this new treatment, then it may be that the coverage probability conditional on recommending the new treatment is much, much less than one minus alpha, right? So conditional on recommending a deviation from the status quo, my 95% confidence set may be wildly over-optimistic. And the distinction between conditional and unconditional validity is precisely whether this situation bothers us, right? If I say, yes, it, it bothers me that whenever I recommend a deviation from the status quo, the results are systematically disappointing relative to my confidence set, well, that says that I want validity conditional on recommending a deviation from the status quo, right? And so I need to impose conditional validity here. If instead I say, well, but the, the setup of this question was that most of the time I recommend sticking with the status quo, Right, so the event that I recommend a deviation is low probability, and so the fact that I do badly conditional on recommending something new, I'm less worried about that. That corresponds to unconditional validity. So having set up these two goals, conditional and unconditional validity, let's say what we can do to achieve each of them. So first, conditional validity. So for conditional validity, right, we're interested in inference on mu theta hat, right, the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment, conditional on recommending treatment one. And the key observation here, right, is I started out with this vector of normal, normally distributed estimates for the effect of treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, and so on. But if I think about what's the distribution of that vector of estimates x, conditional on recommending treatment one, that's just gonna be a trun multivariate truncated normal distribution, right? I take that normal distribution and I truncate it to the set where I recommend treatment one rather than anything else. But uh, truncated normal distributions belong to the exponential family, which means we can use some sort of classic statistics results to get optimal median unbiased estimators and equal tailed confidence sets. Where I'm calling this confidence set equal tailed because it's equally likely to over and undershoot the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment. For the details of the construction here, I'm gonna refer you to the paper, but uh, the intuition here is basically that for this problem, right, if I say I'm interested in inference on mu theta hat, conditional on theta hat equals theta one, mu theta two, the effectiveness of the treatment that I'm not recommending, that's a nuisance parameter. And the estimated effectiveness for that uh, second treatment is a minimal sufficient statistic for that nuisance parameter. So what I can do it's just condition on my estimate for the effectiveness of the treatment I'm not recommending. Once I condition on that, my estimate for the effectiveness of the recommended treatment follows a truncated normal distribution. But truncated normal distributions are things we understand relatively well, reasonably nice to work with, and so I can use that fact to get these optimal estimators and confidence sets. So what about unconditional validity? So if I instead focus on unconditional validity, there are two natural options. One is to just use, keep using the conditional procedure that I just sketched. Right, in particular, I already told you, conditional validity implies unconditional validity. So this conditionally valid procedure is also unconditionally valid. But uh, for unconditional validity, I have more options. In particular, uh, we think about what we call a projection confidence set, which is an approach that's been discussed in the prior literature. For the projection confidence set, I'll take the estimated effectiveness of my recommended treatment, add and subtract a critical value, where this critical value is gonna be something different from 1.96, but intuitively you can think of it as what we're doing is I'm gonna form a joint rectangular confidence set for the effectiveness of treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, treatment four, et cetera, simultaneously. And then I'll take that big rectangle and project it on the dimension of interest to get a confidence set for the thing I'm interested in. If you like, one way to think about what this is doing is it's very similar to just Bonferroni correcting for the number of different treatments that I consider, right? So I said, I ran a horse race between 50 different treatments and I picked the one that did best, so I should do a Bonferroni correction for looking at 50 different things, right? It's slightly, slightly different, but actually mathematically quite close. <laughs> 
Now, as it turns out, neither of these options ends up being fully satisfactory. In particular, as I'll show you in a minute, the conditional confidence sets and estimators perform very well when mu theta one is much, much bigger than mu theta two or the reverse, right? Basically in the case where it's gonna be obvious from the data what the best treatment is, but performs poorly when the two treatments are of similar effectiveness. By contrast, this projection confidence set performs reasonably well when the two treatments are of similar effectiveness, but it's gonna be unnecessarily wide when one treatment is much, much, much better than the other. Now, if we want conditional validity, uh, I've already said the conditional procedures are optimal, so as a theorem, you can't do better, sometimes life is hard, and just conditional inference is a hard problem, and the best confidence that you can get is sometimes really wide. But if we only care about unconditional coverage, we can do better. And to do that, we propose what we call a hybrid confidence set. This hybrid confidence set basically is constructed in a way similar to the conditional, but I'm gonna change the conditioning event. So rather than just conditioning on, I recommend treatment one, I'm also going to condition on the event that the level beta projection confidence set contains the true effectiveness, right? Where beta is gonna be some number smaller than alpha, and for all the numbers I'm gonna show you, we use beta equals alpha over 10. Right, in some sense, the way to think about this is I'm, rather than just conditioning on I recommend treatment one, I say I, I'm gonna condition on the event that I recommend treatment one and the naive estimate may be biased, may be inaccurate, but it's not crazy, crazy, crazy inaccurate, right? Basically what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm not trying to protect myself against crazy tail events, if you like. Now the effect of doing that is gonna ensure that the hybrid confidence set is always contained at the level beta projection confidence set which as I'll show you in a minute, limits the worst case performance of this hybrid approach in the case where the conditional approach did badly. Right, we can likewise propose hybrid estimators and we find that doing this sort of hybrid thing allows substantial unconditional performance improvements. So to illustrate all this, let's go back to this simulation example where I'm just gonna focus on the case with 50 treatments to sort of avoid showing you 20 different uh, versions of this. So let's start with the coverage probability, right? So this is the probability that our different confidence sets cover the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment. Now, as before, we see that the conventional confidence interval uh, dramatically undercovers. Next, if we look at this solid line, this is the projection interval, right? Akin to Bonferroni correction. We see that in the case where all the treatments are of similar effectiveness, this projection interval actually has coverage right around 95%, right? Which is what we wanted. But as I make one treatment much better than the others, it's dramatically over covering, right? Here it's got coverage probability close to 100%, so it's being unnecessarily conservative. By contrast, in the middle here, we've got our uh, conditional and hybrid procedures, and we see that they have coverage close to 95% over all the parameter values we consider. So they're avoiding this sort of big conservativeness we're getting from the projection approach. Now, in addition to caring about coverage, we also care about length, right? I would like my confidence interval to be short, if possible. And so here I'm showing you the median length of 95, of these various 95% confidence sets. We see that the shortest is the conventional interval, but we saw that that undercover, so undercovered, so that's no good. Next, we've got the projection interval, right? The length of the projection interval doesn't vary uh, depending on the gap between the best and second best treatment, but we saw before that it's too long up here, right? In the case where one treatment is much, much better than the other, we could get something a lot shorter than this and would like to do so. Next, this curve is the conditional confidence interval. This uh, is showing you actually what I showed you, what I sort of said in words before, which is that when the treatments are of roughly similar effectiveness down here, the conditional confidence interval is really long, right? So the conditional confidence interval is actually has median length more than twice that of the projection interval in this uh, case where the treatments were of roughly similar effectiveness, right? So I'm getting correct coverage, but I'm getting a really long interval. That's bad. Next, I'm looking at the hybrid interval. Interestingly, we actually see that for this simulation design, the hybrid confidence interval is always giving me median length shorter than the projection interval. And also that the length of both the conditional and hybrid intervals is coming almost all the way down to the length of the conventional interval in the case where one treatment is doing much, much better than the other. And so what this is saying is that if we use either the conditional or hybrid approaches, in this case where, you know, I try 50 things, but one of them is clearly the best, right? So there's not really much of a selection problem. I'm also not really paying a price in terms of the length of my confidence interval for using these corrections. 
So that wraps up what I wanted to talk about from the stylized example. Um, what I hope were some takeaways from this is sort of first, just that inference on the best performing treatment in an experiment invalidates conventional inference procedures. Right? If I try 50 things, focus on the best one, that leads to the systematic bias and under coverage that I started out by showing you. To address this, we develop optimal inference procedures that are valid conditional on the parameter selected. But uh, we also saw that validity conditional on the parameter selected is quite demanding. Right? This is this fact that the conditional confidence interval is quite long in this case where all the treatments are of roughly similar effectiveness. So if we're satisfied with unconditional validity, we propose these hybrid inference procedures, which we find offer substantial performance improvements relative to both conditional procedures and the existing alternative in the literature, namely projection. Now, I should also note that in the paper, we have a number of theoretical results that go beyond this stylized example. Uh, in particular, we uh, have results which allow for you know, the possibility that I'm doing selection on one thing, but then want to do inference on another. Right? So maybe I'm doing selection for the maybe I'm selecting the target treatment based on outcomes for everybody, but then I want to do inference on outcomes for some demographic subgroup. Right? That's an example. We also allow for uh, you know, correlated estimation errors. So my estimate for treatment one is correlated with my estimate for treatment two, and so on, as well as for non-normal estimates non-normal estimators, estimated variance matrices, sort of all the practical things that come up if you actually want to do any of this, uh, we address in the paper. I should also note that there's a large uh, theoretical literature that we're related to, but uh, for the sake of time, I thought that rather than going into that in detail, I'd skip to the application to sort of show what this all looks like in a more practical setting. But before I do that, let me pause here. Uh, are there any questions? Come on up. Mm -hmm. And this one is about the variation in the confidence interval? Yeah, so this is about the, the length of the confidence intervals. Okay, so do we read it from top to bottom or left to right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so this is basically, right, so, so here, so on the horizontal axis here, right, I've got the gap between the average outcome under treatment one and the average outcome under everything else, right? So basically the way to read this is that down here, the treatments I'm considering are all of roughly equal effectiveness. Up here, treatment number one is way, way better than the other treatments, right? So eight standard error is better than the other treatments. And then right here on the vertical axis, I'm showing you the median length, right? So for example, the median length of the conventional confidence interval, well, it's just plus minus 1.96 standard errors, so its median length is always um, 3.92, right? So that's why this is a flat line. Likewise, the projection interval, uh, it's, just adding and subtracting a critical value, that critical value is bigger than 1.96, so it's wider than the conventional interval, but uh, its length, again, isn't varying depending on the parameter values. Right, and so basically, the message here is that um, the conventional interval is short, but it's too short, right? We saw that it undercovers down here. The projection interval has the right length over here, but it's too long up here. The conditional interval is really, really long in this case where the treatments I'm considering are of roughly equal effectiveness, but its length comes down as I make one treatment more effective than the other, so it does well up here. And then this hybrid procedure that we introduced is doing sort of, it's longer than the conventional down here, but it's doing pretty good, and it's almost as short as the conventional up here. Does that make sense? Awesome. Other questions? Hey, Isaiah. Um, I'm just wondering, um, where bootstrapping would fit in this example? Yeah, so that's a, a, again, yeah, really great question. Unfortunately, um, bootstrap won't work here. So basically, you can show that uh, bootstrap, basically, the bootstrap, at least any sort of conventional bootstrap procedure, if you ran it in this sort of a setting, it would tell you that there was a bias, right? So basically, if I, you know, I get my data on my 50 different treatments and I resample, you know, people from treatment one and people from treatment two and people from treatment three and then I rerun my selection and I see how I do. I will see that I'm basically going to be getting an upward bias in um, the effectiveness of these different treatments, right? So I will see the winner's curse. But it turns out the bootstrap does not correctly estimate the magnitude of that bias. Right, and so if you sort of run the bootstrap and then subtract out the bootstrap estimate of bias to sort of say, oh, I'm fixing the issue by bootstrap, doesn't work, um, sadly. 
explain the intuition behind, behind why the hybrid is doing much better on the lower values of the difference than the conditional ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, the let me actually start with slightly flipped intuition, which is why is the why is the conditional so long? Like why is it giving me such a crazy long confidence interval down here? And the reason that that's happening is that um, when I say I want conditional validity, I end up actually trying to protect myself against some really really unlikely but really bad events. Right. In particular. Right, imagine that treatment one is much, 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 much worse than all the other treatments. Still, by chance, some of the time, treatment one is going to end up ranked on top in my experiment. Right? And that's, that, that's an event that happens with really low probability, but conditional on that event happening, I'm in really bad shape. Right? Because conditional on treatment one winning when treatment one is terrible, my estimate for treatment one is super biased upwards. Right? And so basically, what ends up happening is to protect you against that, the conditional is basically going to say, you know, if I've got, you know, 50 treatments that I'm evaluating and the best one is only a little bit bigger than the second best one or a little bit better than the second best one, then the conditional procedure is going to say, well, that's actually the pattern I would expect if treatment one were terrible. And so basically, my confidence interval is going to need to go super, super, super negative, include really, really negative values, because that's the only way to protect myself against this possibility that, like, I just got unlucky and I'm in this bad state of the world. And so that's basically why you end up with these really long lengths for the conditional down here. Now, why does this go issue go away? Well, because as I make treatment one much better than treatment two, right, this scenario where, you know, I've got treatment one is only beating treatment two by a little bit, that becomes less and less and less likely, right? And if treatment one is eight standard errors better than the next best treatment, well, then when I run the experiment, I will always, almost always see that like, oh, it's clearly much better. And so then the conditional basically says, oh, actually given what the data look like, I basically don't need to worry about the fact that there were all these other treatments because like, they clearly are much worse than the one that I've got. And so I can just focus on the one that I've got and it's almost like I'm doing conventional inference. And so that's why you get this really dramatic pattern in the length of the conditional. Now, what about the hybrid? Right? So the trick with the hybrid is, basically, I'm changing the conditioning event exactly to say I don't have to worry about this super pathological case. Right? So one way to think of this is, you know, in this example, it's going to be something like saying, instead of just conditioning on treatment one wins, I'm going to say I condition on treatment one wins and my estimate for the effectiveness of treatment one is within you know, four standard errors of the truth, say. Right? That's effectively what this conditioning on uh, being in the level beta projection interval is doing in this example, is it's going to say, you know, my estimate, is, my sort of naive, uncorrected estimate is within four standard errors of the truth. And so that leaves the possibility that there's substantial bias. Right? Four standard errors off is twice the width of the usual confidence interval. That's pretty bad. but. It does mean that I'm not going to worry as much about these super pathological cases. And so that basically has exactly this effect of saying, you know, in these cases where the conditional interval infers that something really terrible is happening, instead the hybrid interval is going to say, eh, I'm probably biased. I do need to make the interval longer than the usual thing would be, but it's not that bad. Right? While in the case where uh, one treatment is much, much better than the other, I basically end up doing the same thing as the conditional and saying, okay, it looks like there's not a selection problem here. We're good. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? I have a question. Um, so this graph is based off of the choosing between 50 policies, and you mentioned that if you're choosing between just one or two policies, um, that this is less of an issue. Do we see it like, is it? Yeah, exactly. So basically like the, so, so several things become less of an issue, right? So basically one thing is this, this under coverage here, right? Becomes a lot less severe, right? So the, the coverage, uh, you know, if I have 10 policies rather than 50, the coverage sort of starts at 80% uh, rather than 30%. And likewise, uh, if I have 10 policy or two policies rather than 50, Basically, you see a similar kind of qualitative pattern for the conditional, right? Its length starts high up here and then comes down. Yeah. But, you know, it would be a little longer than the, hybrid, than the projection here, not a ton. Basically, the magnitudes of all these things get smaller. And so if I'm, if I'm somebody who's just out here kind of in these policy streets 
and I'm just choosing between like one or two things, I, I worry about this less, right? I worry about when, I worry about the winner's curse less, but yeah, okay, for sure, right? So, so basically, so I think so. Let's take the take the case with two policies, right? So two policies, same standard error, independent, blah. Then basically, right, what this is saying is that in the worst case with two policies, right, my, my estimate is biased upwards uh, in terms of median bias by about half a standard error, right? So on the one hand, half a standard error isn't nothing. On the other hand, half a standard error is not, you know, two and a quarter standard errors. And so exactly like you're saying, the degree of this bias um, sort of gets moderated as I think about a smaller number of um, policies. Although, I guess, as I'll show you in the example in a minute, one thing that actually works on the flip side is there are some cases where we end up doing comparisons where even though we don't necessarily think about it that way, we're doing a comparison actually between a really enormous number of different candidate policies. And so then this, this comes back up. But exactly like you're saying, if I've got two options, this bias is there, but much, much more modest. Anything else? fact that what you end up really comparing it to at the end of the day is also an estimate. Mm -hmm. You know, the estimate of, of how effective the final, like I'm thinking about like this is like a pilot study mm -hmm. or something like that, but actually the estimate of how well, you know, let's give an example from COVID, the vaccine actually works is going to be a mm -hmm. population estimate as well yep. from the larger population. Yeah, so, so again, yeah, all really fantastic questions. Thank you so much. So basically, so we can account for that. Right, so basically the, the way to do that is exactly like you're saying, right, the thing we're going to be evaluating against ex post is still an estimate, right? And so it's possible that, you know, if things got worse in the second round relative to what we saw in the first round, maybe it's not because of winner's curse bias, maybe we just, you know, had a negative estimation error in the second round. So what we can do is actually, you can use the machinery that we have to set up, for example, a test for, you know, is the reduction in performance that I saw does it look like uh, it could just be due to sampling error? Does it look like what I would have expected based on winner's curse bias? Or does it look like actually this is an even bigger decline than I would have expected based on winner's curse bias? And so then maybe, you know, maybe the implementation of the policy in the second round didn't work so well. Maybe this thing didn't scale up the way I was hoping it to, the, the, the way I was hoping it would, et cetera, et cetera. And so exactly like you're saying, right, Sadly, we never know exactly the true state of the world in almost anything, um, but you can, uh, sort of the, the arguments that we're using here extend to account for benchmarking against something noisy in the second round and helping me distinct, to distinguish, you know, is the decline that I'm seeing here what I would expect from winner's curse bias or is it more than that or is it less than that? Anything else? Fantastic. So with that, let me uh, tell you a bit about this example. All right. So for the, for the, uh, to sort of illustrate these theoretical results, I want to revisit the recent literature thinking about neighborhood effects. So in particular, uh, Chetty and Hendren 2018 and a series of related works uh, finds that the neighborhoods in which children grow up appear to have large causal impacts for their outcomes in adulthood. And they do this off of a series of things, but often using, you know, movers designs or siblings who moved at different ages, things of that nature. Now, motivated by these results, uh, Bergman et al. 2020 conducted a randomized trial trying to help low-income households with children move to higher opportunity neighborhoods, where they did this in conjunction with the Seattle and King County Housing Authorities in Washington State. Right, essentially, the neighborhoods that they're targeting with this intervention are defined roughly as the top third of census tracts in the Seattle commuting zone for estimated economic opportunity. Right, and for this illustration, I want to ask what would happen if one were to repeat this exercise across the 50 largest commuting zones in the US? Right, and I'll show you both some simulation and some empirical results for this setting. Now, coming back to the discussion we we're having about sort of how many different treatments uh, are we considering in practice, something I want to flag here is that picking the top third of census tracts in the Seattle commuting zone is actually implicitly an enormous number of treatments, right? Because basically the number of treatments is all ways that I could pick a third of the census tracts in the Seattle commuting zone, which if you work it out, ends up being more than 10 to the 80 in this example. Um, so it's a sort of really enormous number of implicit treatments in the background here that we're selecting among. 
Now, for the simulations uh, in this case, I'm going to sort of take the uh, neighborhood effects model that Bergman et al. are sort of using seriously and treat their initial estimates as the true values for economic opportunity in these different census tracts. We're get, then gonna simulate estimates by adding noise to those census tract level estimates. In each commuting zone, I'll select the top third of tracts based on those simulated estimates, and then I'll conduct inference for the average degree of economic opportunity in the selected tracts relative to the commuting zone. Right, so basically here I'm interested in to what extent does targeting tracts in this way actually succeed in picking higher opportunity uh, tracts on average across commuting zones and within commuting zone. Now, for both the simulations and empirical results, I will also be including a comparison to uh, empirical Bayes estimates and credible sets. The reason for doing that is empirical Bayes estimates using a normal prior are uh, sort of very, very common in the applied literature in this area, estimating place effects, teacher effects, sort of anything with effects across many, many parallel units. Folks use empirical Bayes a lot, so we're including that as a point of comparison here. Oh, sorry, so this ended up being sh smaller than I was hoping, so uh, let me sort of talk you through what these different panels are. So the first panel here is basically just looking at how effective is this intervention, this sort of targeting the top third of tracts, under the simulation design that we're using here. Right, so again, remember, we're looking at uh, each of these 50 different commuting zones. In each commuting zone, we're picking the top third of tracts based on estimates of economic opportunity. And here I'm showing you the uh, hi a histogram across the 50 commuting zones for the gap between the average uh, economic opportunity for selected tracts and the, the average across the commuting zone as a whole. Right, and the, the numbers on the horizontal axis here range from about 0.04 to 0.1, where the units here are basically saying that, again, if you take the neighborhood effects model seriously, right, this would say that for children growing up in households at the 25th percentile of the income distribution, Right, moving from a randomly selected neighborhood in the a randomly selected tract in the commuting zone to a randomly selected target tract will increase that child's um, income rank in adulthood by between four and ten percentage points, depending on the commuting zone. Right, so given that we're talking about uh, kids growing up in households at the 25th percentile, four to ten percentage points, four to ten uh, percentage points in the adult income rank distribution is not nothing. Right, so these are relatively substantial effect sizes, again, if you take the neighborhood effects model seriously. Next, I'm showing you a median bias of different estimators. So here we've got a median bias of the conventional estimator. Not surprisingly, we see that it is substantially biased upwards. Right, well, the magnitude here is basically saying that uh, depending on the commuting zone, the effect here is being overestimated by between half a percentage point and two percentage points. Right, so not swamping the magnitude of the true effect that I started with, but also not tiny. The pink here is empirical Bayes, and we see that empirical Bayes does succeed in reducing bias relative to the conventional estimator that ignores the winner's curse. But in some commuting zones, empirical Bayes is biased upwards, in others it's biased downwards. Finally, uh, the spike here corresponds to the conditional and hybrid, and basically the message there is just that, uh, as we would hope, they get rid of this bias. Next, I'm showing you median absolute estimation error, right? So instead of just caring about, am I biased, right? I also care about, is my estimate close to the truth? And there, we see that the naive or conventional estimator does worse than our corrected estimators, which in turn do actually worse than empirical base. Right, so if all I care about here is how close is my estimate to the truth, you would actually prefer to use the biased empirical Bayes estimator rather than our unbiased or approximately unbiased estimators. Next, here I'm showing you the coverage of nominal 95% confidence sets across the 50 commuting zones. The point here is basically that the conventional or naive confidence interval essentially has zero coverage. It never covers. It's very, very badly uh, undercovering. Empirical Bayes has coverage which varies a lot across commuting zones. So sometimes it, sometimes it does about right, sometimes it way under covers, while our corrected procedures, as they are supposed to, all are succeeding in covering 95% of the time like they're supposed to. Finally, here I'm showing you the median length of these different intervals, and the message here is that the conditional interval is longer than the projection interval, which is longer than our corrected intervals, 
which in turn are longer than empirical Bayes and the uh, naive interval, but remember that empirical Bayes and the naive interval undercover. Okay, that's really unreadable, I'm sorry. Um, so, let me tell you about what's on this picture. <laughs> so, um, so here I'm basically going, and uh, for anyone who wants, the, a, a version of this picture that is much more readable uh, is in the paper, which is on my website. Um, so basically here we're going over these 50 largest commuting zones. And in each commuting zone, we're plotting an estimate and confidence interval based on the naive estimate, the projection estimate and interval, empirical Bayes, and our corrections. Right, and the main point to note is that uh, first, relative to the, naive, the conventional interval, which is in green, both empirical Bayes and our corrections are systematically shifting things downwards. Right, so basically correcting for the winner's curse is making you systematically less optimistic about the effectiveness of this intervention across the 50 commuting zones as you would expect. Between our corrections and empirical Bayes, there's actually not a clear ordering. Right, so sometimes empirical Bayes is sort of more optimistic about the effect of this intervention than we are. In other cases, it's reversed. Nonetheless, uh, even with our corrections, our uh, hybrid confidence intervals never cover zero. Right, and so what that means is that even accounting for the winner's curse across all 50 commuting zones here, we are concluding that if you take the neighborhood effects model seriously, uh, targeting tracts in this way does in fact succeed in selecting higher than average uh, economic opportunity tracts. And so in that sense, even accounting for the winner's curse, the sort of positive estimate that you would have for this intervention doesn't go away. So sorry again for the extremely small picture there. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, in this project, we study inference on estimated best policies or treatments. Right, where the message is that picking the thing that you think does the best can lead to bias or under coverage if you don't correct for it. To fix this, we develop optimal inference and median unbiased estimators, uh, conditional on the parameter chosen, as well uh, where these procedures are basically con converged to the conventional ones in the case where the corrections are unneeded. Right? So this is what we were seeing about how when there's sort of an obvious best treatment, we're not paying a price for these corrections. Now, if we only care about unconditional bias or coverage, we also propose hybrid confidence sets and estimators, which we find outperform uh, conditional procedures and existing alternatives, namely projection. So uh, with that, thank you all very much. Uh, and happy to take any questions that folks might have at this point. I'm going to download your paper to read it carefully. As a Plot econometrician, I'm a heavy user of semi-parametric matching mm -hmm. estimators. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, at least my understanding, Abedin and Inman, is that these things are unbiased, conditional upon the covariate. So as a, a plot econometrician, if I use an unbiased treatment effect estimator, why should I be concerned about this practically? If yeah. my ATE is it's an unbiased estimator, semi-parametric, why should I? Yeah, so sadly, uh Sadly, I'm, I'm, we're giving you another, another form of bias to worry about. Econometricians are so helpful. So, um, right, unfortunately, right, basically the, the issue here, right, is let's, I think it's useful to actually just go back to this stylized example we started with, right? We're like, imagine I'm not, even, I'm not even doing a matching estimator, I'm actually just doing a randomized trial, right? A pure randomized trial, clean as can be. The issue is that Individually, right, my estimate for the outcome under treatment one and treatment two, both of those are unbiased, right? So the mean of x theta one is mu theta one, the mean of x theta two is mu theta two. The trouble is, right, the bias that we're thinking about comes from not saying what's the, what's the bias of my estimate for the effect of treatment one, period. My, the question we're asking is what's the bias of my estimate for the effect of treatment one in those cases where I recommend treatment one, right? or in those cases where I recommend treatment two. And so basically that's the issue, right? So in your case, right, imagine if you're only thinking about one treatment, this issue doesn't come up, life is wonderful, matching estimators are unbiased, provided you're matching on the right stuff, usual story, life is great. But imagine that instead, I'm, you know, I'm gonna use my matching estimator, I'm gonna say, okay, so I'm gonna estimate the effect of this program, I'm gonna estimate the effect of that program, and then I'm gonna estimate the effect of the third program, and then I'm gonna pick the one that does the best. Now you have this winner's curse bias, right? Because from picking the one that you think is the best, you become biased, conditional on focusing on that one. What if I just want to 
Yeah. So then, basically, so it, so the issue, right? So one issue is, you know, you'll make mistakes in the ranking. But the way to think about what we're saying is basically, imagine I rank the treatments, right? And then I say, okay, so I'm ranking, you know, here's, I don't, I don't want to take a side, but you know, Pfizer or Moderna or J and J, whatever, um, right? So like treatment one, treatment two, treatment three. And then here's how good I think treatment one is, here's how good I think treatment two is, here's how good I think treatment three is. Our point is basically the number that you're putting next to treatment one, that's biased upwards. And the number that you're putting next to treatment three, that's biased downwards. And so, um, and so in that sense, right, you, it, basically the issue is if I choose what treatment to focus on or sort of if I think about rankings based on a bunch of treatments and then I think about what's, how well am I doing estimating this thing conditional on where it shows up in the ranking, that's where you get this bias. But again, right, sort of, if I just say I'm running a randomized trial for Pfizer and I'm just going to look at Pfizer and whatever, it's a randomized trial, it's unbiased exactly as usual. Was there another question? I think you answered my question. We were answering Greg's, but um, so I have a, a different question that came up from that, which is, um, so from a practical point, you're trying to do an education intervention to deal with the fact that children aren't learning, you have so many options and people don't agree. And so I think from, well great, and the previous question about the loser's curse and the symmetry, mm -hmm. suppose you implement and you evaluate a policy mm -hmm. and you get it wrong so that it's a great thing for the kids, but then you estimate that it's negatively affecting the kids. Is it the symmetry that you actually, as you said, you're going to rank it worse mm -hmm. than you should? Yes. Right, I mean, like, so you can correct for that. That's my question. Exactly. Now, this is an R, you know, it's a controlled trial. What if you have a problem that is not an <laughs> experiment, right? So you do, a, you're the government, you put in a policy, you think it's gonna help kids, you do an estimate. It's not, a, you know, you've selected the worst schools. Mm -hmm. How does this perform when you try to correct? Yeah, so that's a, I'd be, again, yeah, really, really, really important questions. And so the, the way I would think about this is sort of our, what our corrections can do is they can get you back to whatever degree of bias you would have had absent the selection problem, right? And so imagine that like I'm evaluating five different treatments and I'm gonna evaluate these five different treatments based on like a diff and diff. And for three of the treatments, parallel trends is just wrong, right? So if I'm doing that, then basically I have two sources of bias, right? Source of bias number one is that parallel trends doesn't hold and things are, things are all biased because of that. But then source of bias number two is that I'm comparing these five things and then I'm picking the one that does best or the one that does worst or whatever. And so what we can do with these corrections is we can get rid of that second source of bias. We can basically get you back to where you would have been had you not been doing this comparison across treatment across different treatments, but sadly, right, we, we can't fix the fact that your research design is wrong, <laughs> right? Like, uh, sadly, there's, there's not, um, you know, if, if someone figures out how to do that, that'll be awesome, but uh, unfortunately, uh, so far, yet to, yet to find a way to do that. And so in that sense, the way I would think about this is like, what we can correct for is, um, you know, we compared 10 different things or we compared 15 different things and then we can see what happens, right? And then basically we can, we can get rid of the bias that comes from the comparison across the different options, but we don't get rid of sort of the bias that was there to start with within each of the options. That's, go ahead. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I guess the one, the one thing I would flag, right, that, that is a bit useful um, in a similar vein to that is something we can do, right, is imagine that like, I look in the literature, I see 10 different options. I say, okay, this one looks the most promising. Let me try implementing that somewhere, right? And then I roll it out and I find the results are disappointing. Something we can answer is, are those results more disappointing than I should have expected just from the winner's curse, right? So is it, is it that like those results weren't externally valid, they didn't transfer to my contacts, there was some sort of Im implementation error or is this sort of, yeah, this is disappointing relative to the initial estimate, but only to the extent I would have expected due to winner's curse, and so then maybe I don't have to worry about these other things. So that we can do, but sort of correcting the bias inherent in each estimate separately, we, we can't. Um, I wish. <laughs>
kind of like similar in a sense to when you have, let's say, in banking, you have a model and a bank of stress test, right? So the, the government comes in, we have different models in, in trying to figure out like, you know, the, how to minimize risk. Mm -hmm. But then they rank different models and then they pick the best one and say, okay, this banking should follow this type of uh, models, right? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we create systematic risk. Is yep. that something that this could help us like identify and then try to control for it? Yeah, so this can, this can help us in some ways and not others, I guess I would say, right? So the, the piece of this that that, the, the Sorry, the piece of that that this can help, right, is just that, you know, imagine I, I compare, you know, I'm doing a stress test, I compare these five different models, and then I look at the results, and based on those results, I say I'm gonna focus on this one versus this one versus this, so this one. That induces exactly a bias of this sort, right, because I'm, I'm picking one in a data-driven way, that's going to mean that conditional on making that choice or conditional on focusing on that model, my estimates are biased, and we can sort of correct for that with this machinery, right? On the other hand, what, what doesn't, I would say what this doesn't fix is any sort of like economic risk, right? Where we're gonna use, um, we're doing a stress test and we're comparing these five different models and this model says that asset class A doesn't matter and this model says that asset class B doesn't matter and actually both A and B do matter. Well then, the, both of those, this sort of comes a, a bit back to the discussion we were having before actually where like, both of those models are wrong. They're giving me a biased estimate of the sort of actual economic risk inherent in the system. And so we can sort of correct for the piece of the bias which arises from the choice between models. We can't correct for the fact that both of these models are out of whack, if that makes sense. I wanna go back to the neighborhood literature for mm -hmm. a second. Like, I think we were all pretty excited when moved opportunity results came out and we thought, you know, there's some pretty strong effects here. And then Chetty and his colleagues kind of said, well, there's some neighborhoods you grow up in and they do really badly mm -hmm. and some do pretty well, but they really didn't have an explanation for what was going on. There was a lot of sort of harumphing about what might be happening. Mm -hmm. If you took their ones that were really good and really strong and ran your model on them, mm -hmm. Um, should we be a little more optimistic or less optimistic? Or have you done that? Yeah, I mean, so that's, um, again, yeah, really, really great question. I guess what I would say is we, so what we're doing here is sort of a version, is a bit of a version of that, right? And basically the answer is running these, running our corrections on them basically takes the ones that you thought were really, really good and makes them look a bit less good and takes the ones that you thought were really, really bad and makes them look a bit less bad Right, but it doesn't kind of compress everything down to zero. It's basically sort of attenuating things. And so that's saying that basically here, what we're saying is that, you know, if you take the neighborhood effects model seriously and you think the only issue is this sort of winner's curse bias, we're estimating where's good and where's bad, targeting high opportunity neighborhoods does in fact, even after correcting for the winner's curse, lead to sort of targeting the neighborhoods you think are high opportunity does in fact effectively target places that are higher opportunity on average. But I mean, the, the piece of that I wanna, the piece of that I do wanna caveat is exactly that like, this is under the assumption that the neighborhood effects model is right, right? And so in some sense, in, in so far as we sort of say like, uh, this neighborhood effects story, there's this dark matter that's generating these effects and we don't know what they are and I don't know if they're stable over time and blah, 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 like all of those concerns, this doesn't fix sort of, it comes back to this issue of like, then the underlying model you're using to generate these causal effects is off and what we can do is we can fix the bias that's coming from selection, the bias that's coming from the places you think are best versus worst, but we can't fix the, fa the fact that like, whether the neighborhood effects model is right or wrong is sort of a separate question that our results basically don't speak to. How would you approach the case where it's not a binary decision and you're trying to look at the mix of treatment one and treatment two? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, so the, the case where that's relatively easy to fit into our framework is gonna be, right, imagine that I've got you know, intervention one, intervention two, intervention three, and basically I can have any combination of those three turned on, right? Cause, so I could have no one, no two, no three, one, no two, no three, one, two, no, three, et cetera, right? So in that case, basically what we would do is we would just sort of blow up the set of treatments, right? So I would call, 
one, two, three a treatment, I would call one, two, no three a treatment, and so on. And then basically we would end up with a vector of eight treatments in this world and like that's relatively straightforward to handle. Now, if it's a case where, right, we're sort of doing a more nuanced trade-off, right, so one and two for subgroup one and three for subgroup two and blah, 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 right, that again sort of expands the set of treatments. The data might end up getting pretty thin pretty quickly, um, but that is again something that sort of you would accommodate here by effectively expanding the set of what we're calling treatments to account for all the different interactions that you're considering. Awesome. Oh. So, um, I, I find this very interesting. Um, and yet, you know, I live in a, in a world that's very, um, you know, that's been run by uh, white male men and all kinds of ideas have started at that level. And so now this is kind of looking at choices that have already been made and seeing what, you know, is better or worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of to, and, and, and so it's, it's leaving me with this idea, well, what, what the F? You know, because how do I, you know, the, I, I keep on my door this thing that says, economics must serve humanity. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, what good, tell me the good then, if we can't do something about that other level. <laughs> well, I guess what I could say is, right, I mean, in some sense, I guess I would separate that, right, there's sort of, what do we know about the world and what can we do about the world, right? And I think I, my very econometrician-y answer is that I think, I think it is good for us to know, have accurate knowledge of the world and accurate uncertainty about the world, and then we want to make the best use of that that we can. And so in that sense, I guess what I would say about this is, Whatever policies one is considered, right, maybe the set of policies that people have considered so far is super problematic, given that it comes out of a super problematic context, which, absolutely. Whatever set of policies you want to consider, these issues come up, though, right? So if we are able to consider a much more effective set of policies, a much better set of policies down the road or whatever, these same sets of issues come up. And so I think my view would be that whatever the... Uh, sort of set of policies being considered, right, these issues come up and it's important to correct for them and be aware of them so that we have a well calibrated sense of like, if we are able to do thing A versus thing B versus thing C, what's gonna happen from that? And I guess I would separate that from the very important question of what policies are being studied, what policies are getting attention, et cetera. Does that make sense? Fantastic. With that, uh, thank you all very much.